So I'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, I'd like to begin, uh, although he's not here, to express my gratitude to Father Nyara for hosting the Knights of Columbus and hosting these events. And of course, all of the parish volunteers who have been helping with the, uh, with the food this evening. Their hospitality allows these programs to come to you. Uh, for those of you who did not attend last month, I'll introduce myself briefly. Uh, my name is Thomas Van Iotis. I'm the new Grand Knight of the Regina Chaley Council of the Knights of Columbus. There's information about the Knights of Columbus and the particular focus of our council uh, in the back where uh, Ron was collecting donations. Uh, if you are a Catholic man who is looking to find a way to be more involved in your faith, I would encourage you to consider joining our council. We're very pleased at the attendance last month, and we also have a good crowd tonight. I'd like to remind you that in order to continue to have high-quality speakers and refreshments, we do need your support. We've suggested a donation of $10 per person. Uh, please feel free to be more generous, uh, as not everyone is able to give, and we want to keep these events free for all. Your donations go half to the speaker and to support his work, and half to defray the expenses of the Knights of Columbus in sponsoring this and other events. I'd also like to thank our brother Knight, Mark Bertotti, who has been the driving force behind this speaker series so far. Uh, last month we began, uh, and the topic was the crisis in church and society and how sacred tradition responds. We heard from the perspective of Mr. Ferrara, a civil rights attorney. Tonight you will hear from a renowned historian. I'm also pleased to announce that we will bring Father Richard Munkelt to speak next month, Friday, November 12th. He will still respond in a general way to the same topic, but he has titled his talk, uh, Disease in State and Church, Prognosis and Diagnosis. We're continuing to work on the speaker lineup for the continuing Second Fridays, uh, including looking at the crisis through the lens of musical culture, European history, and canon law. We'll have more announcements about that to come. Uh, each speaker is presenting from his own point of view. We don't expect that they will agree with each other in all details or with everyone in the audience, but we hope the series will present a wide variety of views that will provoke thoughtful analysis and discussion among our families and community. There will be an opportunity to take questions at the end of the talk. We ask you to please be succinct and direct in your questions so that we can answer as many as possible. And now let's take a moment to invoke the Holy Spirit upon our endeavors, that our words and our actions today may be guided by heavenly wisdom, understanding, and prudence. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. O God, who taught the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, Grant us by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dr. John Rao is currently Associate Professor of History at St. John's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at St. John's University in New York City. He has a doctorate in Modern European History from Oxford University. He is well known in Catholic traditional circles as the director of the Roman Forum, the Catholic cultural organization founded by the late Dietrich von Hildebrand, which sponsors events here in New York and in Italy. He's also the past president of Una Voce America. Professor Rao is the author of several books dealing with the question of the relationship of church and society throughout history, including Removing the Blindfold, Americanism and the Collapse of the Church in the United States, and Black Legends and the Light of the World. Also more recently, uh, Luther and his progeny, 500 years of Protestantism and its consequences for the church, state, and society that was published in 2017, and a novel, pure, uh, that is a novel, right? Purification? Oh, no, oh, sorry, you have written a novel though. Uh, so he is also a novelist and also Purification God, Mind, uh, God Mad, which was published by uh, Aurorica Press in 2018. He is married, I, his wife is here, he lives in Manhattan with his wife and three children. So it's my pleasure to uh, join the Knights of Columbus in welcoming Dr. Rao to speak this evening. Just, 
just one correction uh, in the introduction. Uh, I was associate professor of history at St. John's University. Um, I am now, as of yesterday, uh, on an unwanted leave without pay awaiting termination because of not taking the vaccine. All right, I still am officially part of the university. <laughs> but I don't expect that that's going to last very long. All right, but just uh, just say a prayer that this ends well. I have a good lawyer, his name is Chris Ferrara. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now, um, you know, I do talk a lot around New York and around the surrounding area. And a number of you have heard me speak many, many times uh, this summer at the big conference that we had in Huntington, Long Island, on the whole history of the traditionalist movement, just last week at the Catholic Identity Conference. And there's, there's a lot of things that I said at these events which I'm going to inevitably have to repeat because of the nature of the topic here, which basically is the same uh, for, this con for this conference and all these others. Uh, and I have to begin with a story that I know a good number of you have heard already, but I need to do so, and you'll see why right away. And it's a story about my being present at the last conclave. I was a, a reporter for Rorate Cherry for the blog, and I went over to Rome with Chris Ferrara, um, who was working for uh, the Fatima Crusader, Mike Matt for The Remnant, and John Venari for Catholic Family News. And we were there, we were working, we were in the square when Francis was elected. We were confused as to who this man was because none of us at the time had known how much of an importance he was behind the scenes for a good number of years already. Uh, Rorante Chaley, some of you might know, uh, immediately announced that it was a horrifying election and I had no idea as to particularly why. And immediately afterwards, what I did was I had a long, long, long conversation with a good friend of mine, an Argentinian priest from Buenos Aires, who uh, knew Bergoglio very well. And what he told me, uh, after giving specific, specifics of many kinds, is he said, if you try to understand this man, you will lose your reason. Uh, and then he said, people will tell you that he's a Marxist. And when they say that, you say, yes, He's a Groucho Marxist. And then what he did was he quoted one of Groucho's lines. These are my principles, and if you don't like them, I have others. Now, I'm saying this because my whole talk is a follow-up to Chris's talk from a historical perspective. In this case, you're not going to find any disagreements between myself and Chris, who hit immediately on the essential point about Francis, which is tied together with what my Argentinian priest friend said about not uh, being able to keep your reason if you try to understand him and thinking about him uh, regularly changing his principles. And the essential point is that what we're dealing with here is the triumph of the will, the triumph of the will over faith and reason. In Francis's case, as I believe Chris noted last time as well, what you've got with Francis is an assault on the entire Catholic foundation for the Petrine authority and indeed for all church authority and their replacement with his will, what it is that he wills. There was an interesting talk that he gave, Francis, on the 200th anniversary of the uh, restoration of the Jesuits, which took place in the early, uh, the early 19th century after its temporary uh, suppression. And in this talk, he, he was discussing the famous debate over grace and free will, dividing Dominicans and Jesuits. That took place over many decades and which led to the Pope himself presiding over um, long, long discussions in his presence, uh, which ended with a conclusion that uh, they could get nowhere and making a determination. And what Francis said is, this is the sort of thing we need to just let, in effect, a thousand flowers blossom. But one had the idea clearly behind it that his sovereign will would decide what it is that ultimately was allowed and was not allowed. But then the question comes up, is it even his will that triumphs, or is it that of the masters of them that will around them, because around us? Because everything in the secular world we live in, every force in the secular world we live in is playing a game of imposition of will. This is fascist. 
but there are capitalists playing this game with big, uh, big uh, company monopolies. There are Marxists playing this game with the Chinese Communist Party as a kind of multinational corporation and totalitarian political force playing this game. There are libertine ideologues. There's big media. There's a eugenicists. There are transhumanists and posthumanists, with some of these people uh, regularly being favored by Francis. One group of businessmen in particular was identified by him as the guardians, the guardians. So the question is, is it their will or is it his will that's triumphing here? And one other thing that has to be uh, mentioned is that all of these different secular and religious wills that are being impressed upon us at the current time, they, they have their, their grand meetings together with the granddaddy being the garden of earthly delights every year at Davos, where the World Economic Forum meets and where they exchange all of their plans and I would say plot, but you can't even talk about a plot because they openly describe what it is that they're doing. You can read everything that uh, you want about them on the internet. It's, it's ironic that these meetings take place at Davos, because for those of you who are familiar with um, literature, you know that Thomas Mann's famous novel, The Magic Mountain, takes place at Davos. And what you've got there displayed before you is a sick society in a tuberculosis sanatorium, in effect reveling in its sicknesses. And we've got another example of it now. Now, my talk here today is the history of the development of this foundation of ecclesiastical and secular state and social authority on the triumph of the will. And we need to see how this is rooted in the church, and we need to see how state and society and the will of secular forces has won church authorities over to their cause. Some of the church authorities are apostates, and therefore openly and happily uh, promoting these their causes. Many of them are simply befuddled cooperators. And in fact, the secular state and social uh, authorities that wish to see their will triumph, they just simply are using the church. They're squeezing its juices and then spitting it out like a piece of tainted meat once they've got out of manipulation of the church, whatever it is uh, that they would like from it. Uh, everything that I'm talking about here is really uh, discussed in great detail in one of the books that I wrote, the book that is called Black Legends. I never liked that title, Black Legends, because it's not really what the book is about. It's the subtitle that indicates what the book is about. And the subtitle is The War of Words versus the Word. And I use that title because what I try to show there historically is that the triumph of the will um, is something which has got this tremendously long history to it. And uh, what is happening, the game that is taking place in seeking to have will triumph is powerfully disguised with misleading rhetorical babble. Uh, now, the book is out of print, but I have a website called For the Whole Christ, and the whole book is on, on the website. So if you wanted to look at it, you just call up my name and that's, that, that uh, phrase, For the Whole Christ, and you can find this book. All right, so there's three points I have to make in my talk tonight. One, I want to identify the basic problem. And the basic problem is a problem which is already pre-Christian in character here, this battle uh, for the triumph of the will over reason and ultimately faith. Uh, but it's a battle that is immensely, immensely intensified due to the victory of Christianity. So we have to talk about the basic problem first. Then we have to talk in much greater detail about the Christian temptation to accept uh, being co-opted. And this is deeply rooted historically, but what I want to do is I want to focus my attention on the period from World War I onwards. In fact, the last book that was mentioned here uh, is a book that, that uh, really dealt with that subject in detail because a lot of what happens to take over the church for the triumph of the will is something which is done in the name of seeking uh, purity and, uh, and victory uh, in a bizarre and twisted way. And then finally, just briefly, I want to mention something about the way out. Uh, again, I apologize to people who uh, have heard me a lot, 
because there's, there's a lot that you, you may have already heard at the conference in Huntington or in Pittsburgh last week, but there's nothing I can do about it because if you're talking about the crisis in the church, this is it. You know, this is it, so you have to talk about the same things. I'm reminded, you know, one, one time I was teaching the modern intro course uh, at the university, and I reached the middle of the 19th century, and I said, and then there were a new batch of revolutions in 1848. And the students all went, no, no, enough, enough. I said, all right, there were no revolutions in 1840. What am I supposed to tell you? You know, there were, you know, and the crisis in the church, whether in Huntington, I'm talking about in Huntington or Pittsburgh or here, is the same crisis, all right? So in any case, forgive me for anything that's repetitive, but uh, but it's, it's, I think, always useful to have the argument ever clearer in one's head. Now, first of all, the basic problem. The basic problem begins before the Christian era with the Socratics, Socrates and then Plato and Aristotle, uh, becoming aware that there's a problem with the behavior of their government, the state, the polis in Greek. And what they needed to do is ask questions about what people were taking for granted was, uh, was fine and necessary for the state to do. What I call in the book, business as usual. The Socratics began criticizing business as usual and asking what to do about uh, the, the mistakes, uh, dangerous mistakes of the state of Athens in particular correcting. Now against them come this group of people that Plato describes in great detail that uh, are called the sophists, uh, the philosophers, right? The philosophers. Now that's an interesting, an interesting development here because the people who are sophists are really rhetoricians. Uh, they, they are people who have their career based on convincing people uh, to do what they want them to do. And they recognized the sophists that philosophy was powerful and they needed to co-opt philosophy but reduce it from the mission that the Socratics had given it of questioning business as usual to simply justify business as usual. Justify whatever works, and whatever works to satisfy the will of the strong whom these rhetoricians were serving and being paid by. Now, how do they deal with criticizing the Socratics? They deal with criticizing the Socratics by emphasizing, on the one hand, their success in monetary terms, in being buddies with the powerful, in winning, in general, their cause, and the fact that the philosophers couldn't seem to get very far at all. Um, they harp on their success, and then they focus on abuse of their enemy. What are the Socratic philosophers with their critique? They are a bunch of losers. They're a bunch of losers. And here too, uh, forgive me, those you know who know me for a long time, I always bring up this example, demonstrating how strong this argument is with uh, a class I had one evening where I thought I was doing magnificently in uh, presenting my point of view. And I could see this one student getting more and more irritated with me. And he leaps up and he says to me, how much money do you make? And I said, not much. And he turned the class and went Pfft. And that argument works. That argument works. And the philosophers themselves were aware of their weaknesses. They were aware of them being pioneers in this enterprise of criticizing business as usual. They knew that the enemy treated what they were doing as, at best, a kind of game for children or a pastime if you had nothing better to do, as Cicero uh, himself um, expressed when he was in exile. And Plato, in the laws, says something very interesting about the problem of making, um, making a uh, success with philosophy. He says, I don't know how we're going to do anything unless some god comes to save us. Now, some god did come to save them. Uh, the Trinity, the second person of the Trinity, the god man, Jesus Christ, teaching the truth, teaching the way, and the way involves uh, a mixture of using one's free will but under the guiding force of grace in order to live a life that was to be offered universally for everybody and which gained great popularity very quickly. Uh, in doing so, 
What happened with Christianity is Christianity gave the philosophers the strength, the, the supernatural revelation and grace to believe in what it is that they knew. It's one thing to know something. It's another thing to really believe it fully and commit your life to it. So that faith becomes the great, great, uh, great, great promoter of reason as well. Uh, if any of you wanted to follow the great achievement of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and its transformation in Christian terms, the German, uh, the German writer Werner Jaeger, his books on Greek education, Paideia, and the connection with Christianity are magnificent. What you get with Christianity is this message that says the good God created nature and we have to accept and love and cherish all of the things of nature. But people have not used nature correctly. Sin has entered the world in a very powerful way and all of the sins involved with the use of things of nature have to be corrected. They have to be corrected. You can't have business as usual. And when you correct them, you can transform them and elevate them in Christ. Now, from the standpoint of the business as usual people, um, Christianity is monstrous. It's monstrous. That's why, from the beginning, we are identified as haters of mankind, or thing kind, or choose your pro mankind, whatever, whatever you want to talk about. And what I note in the, the, the book, uh, the War of Words Against the Word, is that all of the many groups, and there are many, many groups, that really don't want business as usual to be touched with any kind of critique, they form what I call a grand coalition of the status quo. A grand coalition defending the status quo. But after seeing that it was not possible to neglect Christianity, they tried, but they couldn't, uh, they recognized that it was too powerful to neglect, so that what did you need to do? You need to co-opt Christianity and co-opt its message to drag that message down to earth using all of the power tools and all of the rhetorical tools that you can find to do so. But in order to achieve this goal, you're going to have to claim that you have godly purposes, Christian purposes for what you're doing. But what you're really trying to do is once again uh, maintain business as usual for the sake of the triumph of the will of the strongest. The triumph of the will of the strongest. In the whole of Christian history, probably the most successful period uh, of, of uh, the, the endeavor, at least in terms of, of uh, intellect, setting out the program, and then really, really working in many, many spheres to achieve it, the whole program of accepting, correcting transformation in Christ is the period in the West from the monastic revival uh, that's associated with the monks of Cluny from Burgundy beginning in the 900s down to the time of Innocent III in the late 1100s and early 1200s. Innocent III uh, has got this magnificent vision of uh, what he calls the marriage of everything in Christ. And to uh, achieve that goal, he's the one who's the great promoter of the universities, and then the Franciscans, and the Dominicans, and, and the like. Now, in this period, from the 900s to the 1200s, the grand coalition of the status quo really, really is frustrated. And it goes into high gear versus the whole attempt to accept, correct, and transform all of nature in Christ. Here, too, unfortunately, this book has never been translated into English. It's five volumes, a book written in the interwar period by a man named Lagarde, and it's called The Birth of the Lay Spirit in the late Middle Ages. It's an absolutely superb work, tracing the whole history of what happens here, which we don't have time to be able to go into tonight, otherwise we'll be here till tomorrow morning. Um, but there are a whole battery of different forces involved in this. There are, on the theological level, Gnostics, people who don't believe that a good God had anything to do with the creation of the world, so that therefore there cannot be any successful attempt to make good of it. Um, there are philosophical nominalists who take their aim at the whole attempt to use your reason to try to work together with faith to um, transform the world in Christ. There are, uh, as always, political forces. There is this growing money power that is connected with the rebirth of city life and merchant life 
from the 900s onwards, which uh, is very much disturbed by the, extru the obstruction of anything that they want to do by the whole movement to step back, criticize, correct, and transform. There is later on, when we get into the, um, the scientific revolution, the whole modern naturalist mechanist vision of life and its supporters, who are only interested in what the machine-like study of nature and the machines created through the study can spew out and do, um, what works simply by being able to put machines into operation, and who look, to use the, uh, the language of Francis Bacon, the great, the great uh, uh, founding father, so to speak, of the scientific method, about what happens with the whole Christian vision, they, they, they want to destroy the obstruction that is pre presented by what Bacon calls idols. And the idols are things that would have you step back and question what the machine uh, can do. Uh, whether it can combine human and animal, whether it can combine male and female, so on and so on, because of, of problems with this. And then there's rhetoricians galore, serving the political, money, technocratic, scientific machine. Lawyers, humanists, enlightenment, naturalist popularizers like Voltaire, preachers of individualism like John Locke, Whigs, liberals, and liberals of both kinds, liberal liberals and conservative liberals, and big media, these are all rhetoricians who are all united in their desire to prevent uh, any kind of critique of business as usual. Voltaire's famous phrase about what's needed to be done with the church, crush that infamous thing, is really the motto of all of them. Now, you need to co-opt um, a Christian cover in order to promote the goal of this, the goals of this grand coalition of the status quo, because Christianity is just too powerful. So what happened historically, and I'm, I'm really talking about something that already goes back to the 1100s, is that all of the different forces that I mentioned here, just briefly to give you a flavor of what's involved here, they constantly emphasize that what they're concerned with is the truly God godly uh, will um, of, of, of the creator, the truly Christian will of the creator versus this um, ultimately in Protestant terms whore of Babylon of the Roman church with its vision of, of blaspheming God by thinking that human beings can do something to turn this, uh, this, this uh, valley of permanent tears into any kind of stepping stones for the, major, for the greater glory of God to heaven. We're the ones, those people who are promoting these goals say, we're the ones who have the true will of God at heart and the true Christian will. But when you look at the historical record, what that, what that ends up boiling down to is whoever the rhetoricians who are the paid supporters of these different groups um, uh, say is, uh, is, is the one who should be the agent for promoting God's will, and that ends up becoming emperors, kings, local noblemen, city councils, the people in general, democratically, individuals pursuing uh, the building of their own personality, personalities. But it's always, when you look at the historical record, the strongest wills from among earthly wills that are dedicated to business as usual and don't want the status quo touched, who are the ones that are favored by uh, the greatest of the spokesmen, popularly, rhetorically, uh, for the anti-Christian cause. And one of their goals is to utilize whatever tools they can to keep the ordinary Christian stupid, so as not to be able to have any means of criticizing uh, or even knowing how to criticize what they're up to. All right, now that brings me to this second point, which is the most important one, and that is Christian temptation to accept and aid co-option by this uh, grand coalition of the status quo and uh, the support of business as usual rather than transformation in Christ. Obviously, this is there's always going to be a temptation because there's a temptation to sin. There's a temptation. It's hard to do the job of trying to transform things in Christ and stay committed to it. Um, but there are two basic forms of co-option that take firm shape and historical rooting by the time you get into the 1600s and 1700s and then play out right down through to the present. One of them 
um, emerges out of the whole Protestant revolt, uh, which we can't talk about in detail, except to note, as you all, all know already, that Protestantism by the late 1500s or early 1600s had produced thousands of variants that were all at one another's throats. And in order to deal with the problem of the divisiveness of this battling among Protestantism, they're developed in Protestantism, what is called pietism. And pietism ends up being a very powerful force in creating what is called the moderate form of the Enlightenment, which, uh, which then uh, uh, evolves into what we call, uh, in the broad historical sense, liberalism, the liberalism of John Locke and what comes after him. Now, the, the idea of the Protestant pietists is that, oh my gosh, we're so divided, we look like fools. Uh, we look like fools, and uh, in order to avoid looking like fools and being divisive and killing one another, what we have to do is we have to stop fighting about doctrines. Stop fighting about doctrines other than the one thing that we all agree on. And that is the common sense, and that word, that phrase starts to be used more and more, the common sense doctrine, if you want to call it uh, that, of pastoral charity for all. Because everybody's fighting over the Eucharist, but nobody's fighting over whether you can throw your grandmother out the window. You know, you agree on morality and charity. Uh, and what you do is you say, uh, fighting over doctrines is not Christ-like. What's Christ-like, what's the fullness of the Christian teaching, is charity for all, moral behavior for all, and we all agree what this is. We all agree, we all know what this is, so don't, don't debate over it. Um, and what you, uh, what is going to give you a confirmation of the fact that you're on the right path in following this course is that if you are successful in your efforts to do things charitably for the benefit of your family and for the benefit of your nation, that proves that God's blessing is upon this. And you don't need any other criticism than uh, seeing the success and knowing by the success that you are on the right path. And this ended up getting tied together with the promotion of practical devotion to mechanical scientific studies and producing wondrous mechanical um, achievements, which had um, Bacon as a guide to the marvels that would be created, and as a model on a practical level, the Royal Society uh, of London, uh, led by Isaac Newton as its most famous secretary, with a batch of Christian preachers connected to it, who are proponents of what's called physical theology. And what, mean, what they mean by that is that uh, we don't have to talk about Bible and church teachings to know about God, all we have to do is study the machine of nature. And when we see the machine of nature and how it functions so harmoni harmoniously, and all the wonders that can be created for feeding the hungry and clothing the naked um, and healing the sick, um, we know that in pursuing just the development of the machine of nature, um, we're successful and we're blessed by God. So anything that we can do uh, that produces something that works and we can say is successful for us and for our uh, people around us, our neighbors around us, it's obviously God-like. It's obviously part of common sense Christian morality. And if somebody says, well, shouldn't we step back and see maybe if there's a little bit of self-deception entering in here? The answer is a thundering abuse. No! If you do that, you'll fight with one another. If you start talking about whether there's problems, you got doctrines back in the picture. You're going to be so divisive, we're going to make fools of ourselves, and the atheists are going to win out in this whole regard. And besides, it'll take time away from being successful with our machines fighting over doctrines. Now, this had an influence first in Protestant circles, but it then took very, very great, uh, very great hold over Catholic circles. You cannot believe, unless you're familiar with the second half of the 18th century, how anti-doctrinal the Catholic Church was, saying that, well, what really counts is practical pastoral care, and we all know what charity is, and what works and is successful is obviously blessed by God. All right, then the other form that uh, 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 you get an, uh, an entry into co-opting Christianity through, and here too, I forgive me, those people were at the CIC last week, I mentioned this, is from Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau, um, 
uh, is a radical Enlightenment thinker. But he's different from the other radical Enlightenment thinkers in that he is not an atheist. He hated their atheism. He was a deist. He believed that uh, there was at least some God that created the world, and he believed in an afterlife through soul, not body, but soul. But he does not think that you know the will of God through common sense um, and scientific mecha mechanical developments that seem to work to give you uh, certain blessings. You know God's will through feeling. You know it through feeling, intense feeling, and the energy that is unleashed by intense feeling. And uh, he himself felt that he was the only person in the late 18th century who was going through the process of studying his feeling, his intense feeling. And he argued that since he knows, he knows that God's will is expressed through his intense feeling, and that he's the only one who's really looking for this, uh, the answer regarding God's will in this way, he comes to the conclusion that if he's free, if he has the liberty to be able to pursue his feeling and unleash his energy, that, um, that uh, he'll be able to show everybody else that if they go through the process of getting in touch freely without any outside bonds with their internal feeling, to unleash their energy, that they're going to feel and act exactly as he does. Because God's will has to be the same in everyone. Not just him, but everyone. So when you're free to get in touch with your feeling, you have the liberty, you'll find that you're all equal. And then you can love one another. You can be fraternally bound to one another. You've got liberty, equality, and fraternity. But the rest of the world at the moment does not see this truth. So that he, Rousseau, becomes the prophet speaking to enlighten and awaken all the slumbering masses who will thank him once he awakens them. And if they refuse to be awakened, and they, or if they refuse to thank him when awakened, well, the answer is clear. They are not friends of God, and they are not friends of humanity. They are enemies of God and enemies of the people. Because if they were truly of God and the people, they'd think like he does. Or feel, I'd rather say, feel like he does and unleash their energy. Now, believe it or not, Catholics in the late 18th century, upset by atheism being uh, uh, prop uh, propagandized by radical enlightenment thinkers, at first thought Rousseau was a good friend. A good friend. But the, the real entry of Rousseau's ideas into the Catholic world comes through a priest, the Abbe Felicité de Lamnay, in the first decades, in the, in the 1820s, really, the 1830s, well, from the 1820s, really, to his death. Um, and uh, Lamnay started off with a kind of um, good uh, principle. And the good principle was he was very much disturbed by uh, how a tiny revolutionary elite in France during the Revolution had been able to oppress a whole Catholic people the Catholic people of France. And he began to argue that if only the energy of the Catholic people of France could be rid of this revolutionary, oppressive elite, then all would work out for the world, for the good. But he ran into problems in the period after Napoleon with the, a king who had come back into power, with the bishops of the church serving the king, um, even with the people of France, not seemingly responding all that well to his message, um, even when he said, in uh, recognizing that the king and the bishops didn't seem to be uh, uh, answering his call to work, work really energetically for the Catholic cause, uh, and he turned to the people to see if democratically relying on their Catholic sense would do the trick. Even they weren't particularly interested in following him. And then Gregory the Sixteenth, Pope Gregory the Sixteenth, condemned what he was saying because of the fact that he was arguing in uh, his, his uh, uh, confused way that the source of the teaching of the faith came from the people, came from energy, came from the energy of the people, the feeling, the, the, the feeling energetic Catholic population. But as I said, even they didn't seem to be interested in him. And so one day adopts the Rousseau position. Well, I am the prophet. But as a Catholic with the Holy Spirit behind me, and I have to reawaken 
popes, bishops, priests, and people. And if they are not ready to be awakened and can't be awakened, they can't be of God. They can't really be uh, the, uh, the, the Catholic faith or the true expression of the Catholic faith guided by the Holy Spirit. And that meant that the Holy Spirit was speaking through him as the prophet to guide the church to understand what it's really all about. Now, there's a huge Catholic revival in the 19th century. A huge Catholic revival. It emphasizes the necessity of, of, of teaching and understanding doctrine in order to guide morality and a clear vision of what charity truly means. Um, it goes back to the whole vision of needing to accept nature, work with nature, correct it of its sins by critical activity of the faith and reason, and then transforming all in Christ against the desires of this grand coalition of the status quo that wants business as usual. And there's a huge flourishing of Catholic social doctrine, uh, beginning really with the syllabus of errors of Pius IX and continuing through Pius XII. Accept nature, correct nature, transform nature. Meanwhile, the forces seeking to co-opt the Catholic world, either uh, by this pietist mode of abandoning doctrine and just looking to charity um, and success um, in what you think um, you're doing charitably without criticizing it, or the Rousseauian Lamné version of it, it goes underground um, in liberal Catholicism and modernism and the like. All right, now, that brings us to the post-World War I march to victory of these co-opting, uh, these two co-opting forms of, um, of, um, of uh, entering into the Catholic world. And it's an interesting story, an extremely interesting, and a warning bell story also with regard to things that could happen to any of us in going haywire. Um, one thing that happened with the war and its aftermath is it was a terrible demoralization of Catholic activists, Catholic militants. Um, Part of, this, part of this group were missionaries who were upset by their seeming inability to break through the seemingly untouchable peoples to whom they were sent, whose, whose, whose religious views seemed to have, again, an energy and whose teachers a success that they could not really uh, break that well. And then a lot of the activists in Europe were terribly disillusioned when they were drafted, went into the trenches in the war, and discovered that they were a tiny minority uh, amidst a population that was basically secularized. And then, after the war, were horrified by the energy and successes of the new political movements, fascist and Marxist-Leninist, that, um, that were seemingly winning everywhere around them. That's one thing contributing to moralization. Another thing contributing to moralization were um, papal and episcopal compromises. And this too is a topic we could spend a whole lecture on. Uh, there is the, the, the popes and the bishops talk a good talk about the kingship of Christ in the late 19th and 20th century. But when push comes to shove, there's a very, very great uh, uh, temptation uh, over and over again for the, the clerical authorities to compromise with whatever it is that's the power that be. You can have a name for this uh, in your people who are called clerical moderates who uh, make a deal with whoever it is that's in power and basically to protect the, uh, the, the, the celebration of the cult but not the transformation, the transformation of the whole world in Christ. And I mentioned that the CIC, follow this in detail, see the problems, study the Cristeros movement in Mexico, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Now, if you're demoralized, how do you deal with your demoralization? Well, um, you're going to search for some kind of pastoral tools to use to win. Um, and this is a good thing. And there are a lot of good attempts to try to find pastoral tools to use that will work, aided by a lot of good thinkers. Um, as well, so a lot of what uh, is 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 uh, stirred up in way of demoralization here has valuable consequences for what people call both the outer and the inner missions. The outer missions to the non-Catholic, the inner ones to secularized Christian society in Europe and the Americas. Now, however, there is a huge influence by misleading thinkers and outrightly bad thinkers, and although the term that's utilized to describe uh, the outlook 
of these bad thinkers really is 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 confused itself and used by um ah many people in many different ways. nevertheless the term personalism ah which ah two groups in particular that i'm focusing on here use to describe what they what they consider to be the best um the best intellectual guidance for trying to win in a difficult or seemingly impossible situation ah these these two forms of what ah is a many-headed creature called personalism are going to have a great influence with ah over the demoralized militants and they basically correspond to the two previous forms of co-option of christianity that i mentioned more moderate and more radical now the more moderate one is represented by the personalism of jacques martin ah which is ah oftentimes also uh, referred to by the title of this famous book that he wrote in 1937, Integral Humanism. Um, just briefly, what, what basically Maritain says is that really all modern Western thought is shaped by Christianity. Or whether it wants to be or not, it's all been shaped by Christianity, and Christianity's concern for the individual human person, okay, person, personal salvation. So that's where personalism uh, plays a role with him. Sometimes, he says, sometimes the Holy Spirit that uh, is working even among those people who have been influenced by Christianity and don't realize it and even attack Christianity publicly, sometimes the Holy Spirit pushes these groups that are uh, blithely unaware or even angrily unaware of their Christian influences ahead of where the church stands at the moment. So that the church has got to, in effect, catch up with the insights that they, they, they've garnered. Um, in order to do this, in order for Catholics in the church to do this, rather than attacking all of these modern, non-Catholic, religious, and political developments that are nevertheless influenced, he says, by Catholicism, our duty is to nurture them and to avoid authoritative cracking down on them. Uh, be not afraid, really, is his theme here. Have faith that in cultivating and nurturing these seeming uh, enemies, uh, we can move them to Christ. So once again, have a thousand flowers bloom. Have faith that this will work. The other one is a form of personalism called communitarian personalism. Probably the, one of the most famous thinkers involved with this is a man named Emmanuel Mounier, who had a journal called L'Esprit in the 1930s. And then joining in in their own way are the Dominicans and Jesuits who end up being referred to by the term new theologians. What is their argument? Well, their argument is that the Holy Spirit uh, is uh, manifesting himself in the energy of all of these communities that are successful that you militants are having a problem with. So if you're having a problem with the Chinese, you're having a problem with the Muslims, you're having a problem in Europe with workers, with, with fascists, with Marxists, with whatever it might be, uh, the Holy Spirit is working through the successful energy of all of these communities. And it's your job uh, to dive in and witness, that's the favorite word, witness to the milieu and the particular mystique of the communities in question. And in order for you to do this, you have got to abandon any entry onto the scene with your authoritative doctrinal and moral pronouncements um, and biblical citations and papical encyclicals so as not to obstruct the Holy Spirit. Uh, you are going to, if you try to inject what you know of the faith into the way the spirit is working through feeling and energy, you're just going to inject a sickly Catholic rationalism um, into a living body and kill it. And have faith, all of these different milieu that seem so dangerously non-Catholic and anti-Catholic, the Holy Spirit is causing them all to emerge and converge. This is where Teilhard de Chardin comes onto the scene. See, you even get people like Henri de Lubac, Jesuit theologian, he says when something emerges, you know, an energy, he says it has to rise. 
you know? Like it's a gas or something. It has to rise. And that means anything can rise to heaven. Now, here too, I keep apologizing because I know some of you have heard this ad infinitum from me. But let me just give you a flavor of what they're saying here. And you should be able to see how all this is veering towards Vatican II and what we've got now. This is Amunier. This is new. He's talking about convergence. Surely the development is slow and long when only average men are working at it. But then heroes, geniuses, a saint come along, a Saint Paul, a Joan of Arc, a Catherine of Siena, a Saint Bernard, a Lenin, a Hitler, a Mussolini, or a Gandhi, and suddenly everything picks up speed. Human irrationality, the human will, or get this, human irrationality, the human will, or simply for the Christian, the Holy Spirit, suddenly provides elements which men lacking imagination would never have foreseen. So the Holy Spirit is equated with human irrationality and human will here. But idiots like us can't see this. May the Democrat, may the communist, may the fascist push the positive aspirations which inspire their enthusiasm to the limit and the plenitude. All right? Now these people are more and more influential. One uh, thing, however, is they all have the Rousseauian, um, Manasian, Lamanese, uh, prophetic uh, uh, spirit to them. Because they are aware that the mob doesn't understand these ideas, and it's only a profound elite that does so. So the elite, which can be recognized by its witness um, to the people that it's sent, the people that, uh, that the elite is sent to will just naturally understand that they should follow the elite in order to be fulfilled and completed and move towards where the Holy Spirit wants them to go. Now, the war years were a huge boon. The Second World War years were a huge boon for this argument about energies triumphing over everything. Um, France was a, 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 a factory for this stuff. Uh, in, in the part of France that was unoccupied by the Germans, Vichy France, they were set up an elite school at a town in a place called Oriage. And I, not everybody, but practically everybody that played some sort of influential role at Vatican II theologically, who was alive at the time, taught at this school uh, in its first years. People like Yves Congar were in prison were in prison camp. They couldn't do so. Valerie de Lubac and others, Mounier and others were, were, were all teaching there. Teilhard's ideas were bandied about like mad. Uh, starting off with um, the recognition that fascist energies had crushed the Western democracies and shown that something new needed to be done. But the fascist energies committed the gravest crime for people like this. They started to lose. They could only be looked to uh, as a voice of the Holy Spirit if they were winning, and they started to lose. And instead, the elite at this school, as Marxist energies reflected in the resistance movement in France, began to demonstrate their success. That loomed as the voice of the Holy Spirit through its successful energy. And the elite dispersed from this school, forming flying squadrons to teach the Marxist resistance, and even the de Gaulle resistance, what it was that they were really striving for, because it's the elite that knows. Now, what is very, very much central to the development of all these ideas is uh, the worker-priest movement from 1943 to 1953, with its main center in France. Um, there's a, a very fine book, I don't think this one's also translated into English, by uh, a man named Emile Poulat, on the whole worker priest movement, which is extremely, extremely um, instructive. I've got another citation here. I don't know what. Oh, th this citation, forgive me, I know I'm going over time, but you have to do the whole argument. I'm sorry. That's why the clock is useless for me. Uh, but but there, there's a description. There's a description by students at the school at Oriage about what their teachers uh, were like, the elite that was teaching this stuff. Uh, this one student talking about the leader of the school, he took upon himself a certain sacerdotal role, even regarding the wives and children of his instructors. This, entire, this entailed a separation between the leaders, the lesser leaders, the lesser, lesser leaders, the almost leaders, and the not at all leaders. The central team were gods. They were gods. 
All right, so this worker priest movement, what is this? Well, France had a big, um, you know, social uh, Catholic movement that was concerned for evangelizing workers. There's a lot of industrial workers, a lot of priests that are involved in it. Uh, then in the war, there is a lot of forced deportation to labor camps. Hundreds of thousands of Frenchmen go off to labor camps in Germany, and there are Catholic priests that are deported, and also who, who uh, go there, some of them willingly, to, um, to, to, to try and serve the population, the working population deported. And um, many of the Catholic priests, or the, a number of the Catholic priests, trying to serve the community of workers inside France, and then the others deported, they, uh, under the influence of these ideas, they start saying that the worker milieu is revealing to them the Holy Spirit speaking in a way that they must heed. And it's more and more and more Marxist uh, what it is that they claim the Holy Spirit is teaching through the milieu of the workers. Um, uh, Father uh, Diyar, who was one of the, 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 the uh, priestly figures at the school of Uriash, uh, began canonizing um, the Soviets he encountered in labor camps and said that workers, uh, industrial workers, were obviously born endowed by God with special virtues that no other people had access to. Um, then he says there were riches in modern disbelief in atheist Marxism, which are presently lacking to the fullness of the Catholic consciousness. Um, enlightened spirits, this is another priest, had to, quote, share the faith in and the mystique of the revolution and the great day, that of the total Christ, um, dying turned toward Russia, mother of the proletariat, as towards that mysterious homeland where the man of the future is being forged. This kind of language. Uh, that you hear. Now, what is it that's a block to tapping into the worker spirit? Your Catholic education, your doctrine, um, your mass, your mass, your holy sacrifice of the mass. All of this must be abolished to witness to the Holy Spirit through the milieu that you're, you're working in. And the liturgy has to be transformed to satisfy what the milieu teaches you. The liturgy has to be. And I forget whether it was Father Diard or another priest who also had been at Oriage who said he began to understand that the machines in the factories that you were dealing with were themselves spiritual and were providing grace for you. Now, there have been all sorts of liturgical experiments that have been begun since the end of the second, the First World War, uh, the scouting movement in France had been a center for trying to, um, to trying to create liturgies to deal with manly scouting activity. And now you've got this stuff um, that's gonna that's gonna come along here um, to be promoted uh, about um, about what you should do with the liturgy. Let me just let me just uh, uh, quote you uh, this to get an idea. This is Father Diard again. He's talking about his time in the camp. My Latin, my liturgy, my mass, my prayer, my sacerdotal ornaments, all of that made me a being apart, a curious phenomenon, something like a Greek pope or a Japanese bonds of whom there remains still some specimen provisionally while waiting for the race to die out. Religion, as they, the workers know it, is a bigotry for pious women and sheep people. Um, if we succeed in relig ridding our religion of the unhealthy elements that encumber it, petty superstition, this going to mass hypocrisy, we will then easily find with the spirit of Christ the mystique which we need to reestablish our homeland as a Christian place. You know? So abandon Catholicism to have Catholicism succeed. And if anyone complains about it, well, you're the elite prophet witnessing as the prophetic God. Those of you who want a really good critique of what's at stake here, especially with regard to how it applies to the liturgy, read Dietrich von Hildebrand's book, Liturgy and Personality, which is an absolutely superb attack on what happens if you do not, with the liturgy, look to the God that teaches you how to correct and transform nature. You do not look to that, but instead look to yourself, like staring in a mirror, so that you can learn what it means 
for everybody to really follow the Holy Spirit and then uh, embrace the true pathway to God. Brilliant, brilliant, and small book. Now, we're getting to the end, but this continues after the war. It continues after the war in both forms. Again, Jacques Maritain. Who is Jacques Maritain? Probably one of his closest friends in the church, Giovanni Battista Montini, who becomes Paul VI. They're like this. Um, and Paul VI becomes a kind of, a kind of uh, um, well, I mean, an active Episcopal promoter of Maritain's ideas. Maritain after the war says, the world has now been chastised by the horror of totalitarianism. People now know how horrible authoritarian actions are. They're ready for Christ. They're ready for Christ. Don't ruin their readiness for Christ by insisting on doctrinal excommunications and all the rest. Just welcome them. And Maritain had spent the war in the United States and had become extremely fond of American pluralism and American religious freedom open to all of these wonderful influences which even if they seem non-Christian or anti-Christian are really begging to become Christian. And what one needs to do is guide them to the future. And Maritain says the Marxist energies are also to be heeded, but they need by the prophetic elite to be weaned away from their rough edges. And by the way, in this project of fighting Marxist influences that are looked upon as being bad, uh, one person, one group extremely ready to promote the Maritanian idea and religious freedom and everything that, that signifies in the United States against the Marxists is the CIA. Uh, the CIA's deep influence in trying to move the Catholic Church down the direction of pluralism and religious freedom is open for everybody to see. And any of you who have never seen David Weinhoff's book, on the union of the CIA and uh, media forces like Henry Luce with Time Life, and then uh, the Jesuit uh, fellow traveler um, who is um, is uh, is going to uh, uh, aid them in their cause, John Horton Murray. Please do take a look at that book. Now, what about Mounier, the new theology people? Well, they're still active, and they are active not just in Europe, but in Latin America, Maritain is active in Latin America as well, and third world countries in general. And Paul VI, when he is Montini and Bishop of uh, Archbishop of Milan, very much tries to save neo, neo, uh, new theologians and their work from the excommunications that Pius XII uh, was um, was leveling against, or the the putting of, of their books on the index, and then the warnings. Uh, of Pius XII in several encyclicals from 1949 down to 1954. And what is the argument again? Get rid of Catholicism to let Catholicism win. Catholicism as we know it is the enemy of Catholicism. It's only if the Holy Spirit can be able to express himself through the energetic milieu will you be able to get anywhere. Listen to Mounier by the time we reach the end of the war. I'm citing from an article that I wrote here uh, that, um, that uh, really says it all, I think. Uh, by the last years of the war, I'm citing uh, this, this, this couple of books on Mounier and the New Catholic Left, which are important. By the last years of the war, there was little place for sin, redemption, and resurrection in the debate. The central acts of the Christian drama were set aside. Nietzsche's critique of slavish Christianity now seemed to Mounier to be unanswerable, and he came to think that Roman Catholicism was an integral part of almost all he hated. Then when he searched his soul, he discovered that the aspects of himself which he appreciated least were his Catholic traits. Doing what one willed was the one necessary thing. Everything rational from the Greek tradition used to support Christianity and dampen the will was execrated as well. If there was anything valuable in the Greco-Christian heritage, it had to come from personalists rebuilding it from scratch. Those appealing to the Catholic name and Catholic practice required diagnosis and psychiatric help. Mounier now flatly denounced old-fashioned Christianity and Christians. Christianity, he wrote, was conservative, defensive, sulky, afraid of the future. Whether it collapses in a struggle or sinks slowly in a coma of self-complacency, it was doomed. Uh, Christians are, quote, these crooked beings who go forward in life only sidelong with downcast eyes. These ungainly souls, 
these wares up of virtues, these dominical victims, these pious cowards, these lymphatic heroes, these colorless virgins, these vessels of ennui, these bags of syllogisms, these shadows of shadows. Metaphysical speculation was characteristic of, quote, lifeless schizoid personalities. Mounier even referred to intelligence and spirituality as bodily diseases and attributed the indecisiveness of many Christians to their ignorance of how to jump a ditch or strike a blow. Modern psychiatry, he wrote, had shed light on the morbid taste for the spiritual, for higher things, for the ideal, and for effusions of the soul. Thus, many forms of religious devotion were the result of psychosis, self-deception, or vanity. Prayer was a sign of psychological illness and weakness. All right, this is Mounier after the war. And you ought to be able to see that it's this kind of mentality that is going to lead to the argument that you must look for uh, Marxism in uh, oppressed milieu that need to be liberated and teach through liberation theology what Catholicism as the Holy Spirit wants it is all about, or look to third world religions and get what they teach successfully and energetically to their people to restructure Catholicism and the liturgies in uh, their, uh, their own way, under the prophetic guidance of these leaders. Now, what happens to Vatican II? What happens to Vatican II? Well, the two of them end up working together, the pluralism and uh, the, uh, the energy crowd of Mounier and the New Theology. Mounier is dead by this point, but the New Theology people are about to become cardinals um, in the course of the 1960s and afterwards. So what do we have done in Vatican II? We abandon doctrinal guidance. We focus on pastoral optim uh, openness, optimistically. We look to the pluralist voice of the Holy Spirit. And when you free everything up from doctrinal authority, and you optimistically open yourself to everything, what do you get? You get the domination by the will of whoever is strongest, led by the prof prophets and the prophetic voice that is giving witness. And they demand a Catholicism and a liturgy that fits the Holy Spirit's demands in whatever it is that they are interested in. You name it. You name it. Whatever it is that they could be interested in. And if anybody disagrees with you, like people who think as we do, well then, you are obvious losers, enemies of the Holy Spirit. You don't want to win. You don't want to win um, in what has to be now not a restoration of all things in Christ, but a restoration of all things fallen in a sinful world, proclaimed as being the victory of Christ. All right, any criticism is anti-Catholic because the Holy Spirit is behind what they want. They want. It will help atheism. Uh, it shows an authoritarian, totalitarian mentality to want to uh, obstruct the energetic feeling of all of the many peoples around us. And what you have to also do is wipe out in future generation all means of knowing what past Catholicism taught. Hence you destroy the seminaries. Hence you destroy the schools. Hence you destroy the preaching. Um, and all of this, all of this, with the pressure of the rhetorical propaganda of uh, all of the many kinds of rhetoricians on behalf of all of the different engines that are at work here, political forces, uh, bureaucratic, um, materialist, capitalist forces, Marxist forces, libertine forces, uh, anything, uh, all of this um, is, is, is then promoted and, uh, and, and, and added to the pressure that believing Catholics feel due to the strength of uh, the media and uh, the money that's behind it. Uh, condemn what have we got here again? What we have with the Socratics, the Sophists and the Socratics. The people that are Catholics in the old sense are losers. They're losers, and they're not even Catholic. And do you argue with them? You abuse them. You abuse them, and you try to strip any knowledge or any ability to gain knowledge of what the Catholic faith was really all about. You're restoring all things in fallen, untouchable, uncorrectable nature, and you're doing it by the exercise of my will. Whoever's will is strongest in a given, pa in a given parish council, in a given diocese, in a given country, uh, in Davos. 
um, whatever it might be. Uh, ultimately guided by what 19th century Catholic counter-revolutionary uh, thinkers said was going to be a kind of worldwide monotonous materialist sameness, which would be a mixture of, uh, of, of capitalist materialism and, and Marxist materialism. They called it the empire of the world in which everything would be done in the same way everywhere. And now, uh, in responding to its strength and success, uh, baptizing what is done as Catholic as well. All right, now finally, the third uh, point, very short, the way out. This is simple. My last apology to the CIC attendees last week in repeating what I said there. Uh, the way out. First of all, why even bother to talk about a way out? We have no choice. We have no choice. Where would we go otherwise than Catholicism? Uh, you have the words of eternal life. Or if you wanted to put it in another form, uh, perhaps too popular to really be able to, uh, to say uh, commonly, it's almost as though we have to say, dear Jesus, you are stuck with us. You know, We're, We have no choice. We're not going to go anywhere else. We can't do anything but we, uh, what we are doing. We have to carry on as we are doing. Even though all of the forces of uh, the, the, the powers that be are against us in state and society and have uh, the Pope himself in his creation of the mystical body of Pachamama uh, as their, their chief preacher. We can't do anything else but fight for what we know is the faith. But is it really as hopeless as it seems to be? Um, well, no, no. For one thing, because no matter how tiny we are, and we see this every day around us, now, we are a gigantic pain in the neck to all of these supporters of the grand coalition of the status quo. Uh, even if there were only two of us left, we would be the biggest threat in the world because they know that Catholicism and then its Socratic ally are the only forces that have ever really stepped back and tried to do something with this world around it, around us to make it pleasing to God and uh, to uh, dominate its sinfulness. And as I said in Pittsburgh last week, uh, it's not hopeless because there is simply no such thing as a lost Catholic cause. If it's the apocalypse, we win. It's over. We win. You know, we win. We have to fight. I mean, there's, no, there's nothing that says that St. Michael's there. We have tickets as spectators to the apocalypse. We still have to fight. But if, it, if it's the apocalypse, we win. All right? So we win. If it's not, if it's not, well, I uh, repeatedly make reference to this phrase of the French um, uh, monarchist thinker, Charles Maras, who said, uh, anyone who thinks anything is ever definite in politics is an idiot, is an idiot. Um, things can change overnight, as they did in 1989, seemingly, with the collapse of the Soviet bloc, as they did in the reign of terror in France, where one day counter-revolutionaries were being executed, and the next day the revolutionaries promoting it were put on the chopping block. Um, and even if it's not fast, our experiences historically is that when we've moved from one seemingly lost Catholic era into a new one, it's only been a springboard for an even more glorious era, as happened with the move from the collapse of the late Christian antique world um, to the world of the glorious Middle Ages. The key is that we keep fighting uh, in this battle. And I don't see that there's any other message that we can possibly have. We have nowhere else to go because we know that Christ has the words of eternal life, and we know that there's no such thing as a losing Catholic cause. Now we have to fight, and we have to fight with humor, because the people who are supporters of this business as usual grand coalition of the status quo are the most humorless figures uh, that you can possibly imagine. Uh, what you have to do is look at them um, and uh, hear them in places like Davos or in all of their other uh, many, many um, um, uh, bastions around the world, around the country. So we have to fight, we have to fight with humor. So I will leave you with this final word. Um, tonight, when you're done with this, listen to the groans of Mother Earth, as Pope Francis says. Listen to Mother Earth's cry for you to enjoy the fruit of the vine. Get a glass of wine and sit there in front of a good film that knows how to make fun of life and make fun of sinful people. And I would suggest that you look at a film by Groucho Marx in order to do so.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. Uh, we do have some time for, as long as you have time, we can take some questions. I did want to make uh, one more announcement. Just there is a flyer about next month's program, which will be Father Monkelt um, at, the, at the table where you came in, so you can pick, pick one of those up. Um, Mark is going to have the microphone in his hand, sort of floating around, so uh, raise your hands, ask questions, try to be succinct so that we can get um, to everyone's question who wants to ask. Question. Um, so I found it very reassuring that you gave us the long arc, going all the way back to the ancients, um, to understand that what we're facing now is part of a long history. Um, so in your view, are we facing something now that is unprecedented and terrifying, or is it just um, still the same struggle? And um, would that be another way to look at it, hopefully, because I, uh, at this moment, and at hearing your story of being driven out of your job, I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult moment, I think, now. No, I think that this is the most unprecedented and the worst crisis of this sort uh, in the history of the world. Um, and um, it's, 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 it's the crisis that has the most unity of all of these various forces that don't want to uh, step back from business as usual. It's got the strong, strong unity of these forces. It's got the church co-opted as never before in history. My wife was saying on the way up here that it's hard to recognize anything Catholic in Pope Francis. You know, I mean, it's hard to recognize it. Unlike, uh, you know, Paul VI, where you could see anguish of two parts of him fighting against one another because the smoke of Satan had entered the church. And then at the conference that we had in Pittsburgh last week, I mentioned another element that makes the current crisis infinitely more dangerous. And that is the fact that the, the rhetorical engine um, that is pressuring us is so much more developed than ever before. Um, I quoted an article by uh, a friend of mine who is a, a, a computer expert at the University of Illinois that was popularizing the work of two uh, much more detailed researchers from, uh, from Harvard and the Collège de France about the way in which um, the, um, the uh, uh, the big, big information collectors like Google and um, and Facebook and the like uh, have now so sophistic uh, uh, in such a sophisticated way for a number of years uh, found ways of gathering their information about people, uh, penetrating into people's daily lives by by apps and other things that that uh, explore further information about people, and then uh, using, transferring this into useful software that is then sold and is being sold very, very effectively uh, to everybody from the Chinese Communist Party to uh, big, big uh, farm, to, to pharma, to, to, to big political movements and the like, and the clearinghouse is Davos. Um, because it's at Davos that all of these people have come together and seen how their machinery all works. And it gets translated then into uh, techniques that are used to drill in and drill in and drill in and drill in the same themes um, in a way that the last, the experience we've had now with this COVID um, uh, terror has demonstrated the power of. What you've got here, I think, is the most sophisticated use of terror by a unity of very disparate and hopefully ultimately not so united forces for the manipulation of the population. And it's proven to be incredibly successful in a way that would not have been the case um, 50 years ago or 100 years ago. That makes this even worse than before, all right? And, and I um, veer back and forth because, because I, I, I do take seriously this idea of looking at the signs 
And you know, there are apocalyptic signs. There are, and I think it'd be foolish to ignore them. But again, as people, many people have said over and over again, it doesn't do us any good to rest with that. You still have the same fighting to do. And, and we might drop dead in like one minute from now, and our apocalypse has come anyway. You know, but um, but it, it is. I, I I think it is the worst in history. That's interesting. You know, um, um, uh, what what I personally experienced uh, uncovered, and I think that's ironic. I mean, unmasked <laughs> by the whole of the last uh, uh, 19 months or so. Uh, what I've seen has jogged my memory about things that I knew in certain contexts in the past, but never really paid enough attention to, or put together with different elements to create a cohesive picture. And one of the biggest eye-openers to me was a conference that I went to in Mexico uh, four or five years ago. It was a conference. It's an international Catholic um, uh, lawyers conference. People from every continent go to these meetings. They're in Europe and, and Latin America, all over the place. Chris, has been, Chris Ferrar has been to them. Um, and they wanted for this particular conference a historical perspective on the argument that they were uh, uh, addressing. And this was, as I say, four or five years ago. What they were addressing was transhumanism and posthumanism. And I said to the organizer, who's a professor in Madrid, I knew nothing about transhumanism and posthumanism. He said, well, now's the time for you to learn um, because it's, it's serious. And so something that I thought was a kind of science fiction game, when I started to do research on it, I realized was not only this massive phenomenon with academic backing all over the Western world, but also governmental backing, uh, private scientific backing, and people like Bill Gates and the others all have their hand in it as well. And that too, this transhumanist, posthumanist agenda is represented very strongly at Davos. Um, and you might know, I mean, last the year before the disaster, uh, I think it was the Secretary of State of the, of, of the Holy See that went to Davos. And Pope Francis praises Davos. Uh, the only person that I know of, there might, I'm sure there are others, of great renown who attacked Davos at Davos was Donald Trump. Um, but uh, but, but uh, they were, they, they, they're, they're all active there. And these transhumanists, posthumanists, are merely developing something which is rooted in the very nature of the naturalist enlightenment. And the naturalist enlightenment, which uh, ultimately has to be radical in character, is one of the great writers of the enlightenment, um, uh, uh, Jonathan Israel, who's at Princeton, has said, what's called the modern enlightenment is only a holding action for the radical. It's like conservatives who usher in liberals by just simply trying to be moderate. Uh, you can't win in that regard. The whole argument is that everything is machine-like in character, and you find the clear arguments in this regard from the very beginning with people like Spinoza, who say everything that's here has always been here, it's always evolving, it's always the machine spewing out what needs to be done to perfect the machine, and there is no nature or natural law behind the movement of the machine. The machine is its own reason for being. So there is no natural law regarding man and woman or mineral and animal and vegetable. All of this can evolve and mix, and we can learn how to evolve and mix it. Um, and people were talking about this from the very beginning. The transhumanists and the posthumanists, building upon the immense developments in science and technology uh, over the whole period since especially the end of the Second World War, um, see this transhumanist development uh, now reaching its conclusion, at which time we will move into the whole post-human world. 
and everything involving what we know about humanity will go down the tubes. Anything will be possible. Humans can become anything. They can live for thousands of years. They will mix with animal characteristics. Male will mix with female. Uh, the speed of, 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 of animals will mix with human, um, human um, uh, uh, abilities in other regards. And they even talk uh, they even talk, and they talk openly about this, about the fact that the losers who will not accept this will have to be put off on reservations um, in order to uh, live isolated from the others and, uh, and, and not disturb what must take place. And the centers for this thinking are in Oxford, they're in, in, in the United States at various places, they're backed by a lot of government money, they're backed by Gil, Bill Gates. They're backed by big academic foundations. It's unbelievable uh, what's being done. Uh, just one other thing. Uh, I found out in doing this, because I knew nothing about it, that uh, in, in a way that shows how everything is interconnected and can be manipulated so easily, that the first major political legal case involving what could happen through the mixing of man and machine uh, was when Dick Cheney became vice president because he had a pacemaker. And the pacemaker sent messages off to his doctor's office. And from the messages to the doctor's office, people could tap into secret information from the American government and utilize it for his own purposes. So they had to cut off the messages going to the doctor's office. And here we are, you know, doing our own little thing acting as though there's not this massive equipment up there through Google satellites, uh, garnered through Google satellites, being sold to, and I mean literally, everything from uh, big, big multinational companies to the multinational company, which is also a totalitarian force, the Communist Chinese Party, you know, which is, you know, if, if anything is combined both evils to the utmost degree, the Chinese Communist Party has done so. You know, but the others are not far behind. I'm going to take my most prerogative and, and ask a question. Um, so it seems to me that there are two large ideologies that have emerged in the last, say, 20 years. So there's wokeism, and then there's this sort of nationalist populism, which may be best represented by Donald Trump and the Brexit movement. Right. And I'm curious sort of how do you put the, which seem to be the two ideologies that are really at least publicly battling right, right now. What, how do you fit that into this historical framework that you presented? Well, I mean, the thing is that uh, on the one hand, on the one hand, the populist awakening is something which is a hopeful sign. It's a hopeful sign, um, but populist movements throughout all of history have always suffered from the fact that they're too narrow in their understanding of things. You know, so that for example, for example, you get the populist Catholic uprising of the Vendée in Western France. One of the things that justifiably Lamine looked to as a sign of you know, real Catholic energy, but they don't know how to get it out of its narrow provincial uh, region uh, where it operates, because to do so you'd have to have a wider uh, structure, organized structure, you'd have to build bigger armies, you'd have to uh, make all kinds of contacts that these people very much tied to their local homelands didn't really want to do. They intellectually understood a lot about the struggle, but they didn't know exactly how to get out of their narrow uh, uh, tools for fighting for the cause. And in many respects, on the positive level, what Donald Trump represented was a kind of uh, finger in a dike, um, aware that there was something wrong, but not having the whole picture by any stretch of the imagination. And as a result of that, you then have the guides of the populist movement really not knowing how to expand it to, um, to, 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 to get the proper guidance, um, and teaching that you would need to really be able to fight properly. Now, mind you, where's he going to get it from? You know, because where you would look to normally, if you had some uh, sense of that, and he seems to have had some instincts of that. I mean, you know, again, it's it's small, but it's there, um, and it's symbolic. The fact of having the Ave Maria sung from the White House, you know. But if you're if you need guidance, what do you look to? 
I mean, are they going to look to this room and me? You know, no, they're not going to look to that. Um, and if they look to the mainstream authorities of the church, all they're going to get are people who are either part of the game or who have been co-opted already and don't know or have the capacity for leading. So, I mean, a lot in a lot of cases, the populism reflects a real sense that there is something wrong, something really wrong that needs to be dealt with. And that's good. Um, but what you need is a fully awakened leader or leadership to be able to guide that energy and wrath. And I don't see that that's really there. You know, um, it's needed, but it's not there. And one has to pray that it, it will come. So what you're talking about, John, is kind of reminding me of this um, group of teachers, the New York Teachers for Choice, um, which uh, they, they're the ones who've been bringing the suits in federal court. Right. The, um, the thing I'm noticing about this group is that it's a combination of progressives, conservatives, um, it's a mixed group right. to really people who would not normally come together. We sort of want to join this to, to what you were just saying about how populist movements need somebody from the, you know, to lead. Given that the internet has given us, in addition to all of the negative stuff that you were just talking about, it's also given us um, uh, in the populist uh, ground movement, more ability to connect with each other, to um, get information, to transmit information. Is there a possibility of growing that kind of leadership from the bottom up in the current government? Well, you know, quite frankly, Diana, I think anything is possible right now. And I mean, it has been a huge help to be able to touch large numbers of people and also to free people who are very isolated um, and uh, connect them with bigger communities and give, give them hope. And uh, I think this is where Maras's comment about uh, anybody who thinks there's anything definite in politics being an absolute idiot, um, it, it is possible. And um, it, 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 we, believe, we believe in providence and we pray that from out of all of this uh, mess, something may emerge. So I, I think it's that it fits into what I was saying earlier. We have to carry on with what we're doing. We have to utilize the tools that we uh, that we're utilizing. We have to because we know that no matter how small we are, we are an irritant to the uh, dominant forces around us. And um, and uh, and and. Uh, once it's the case that people in greater and greater numbers actually physically suffer, I mean, it is from the blood of the martyrs that the church grows, including leaders of the church grow as well. So I think that I would fully encourage everybody to, you know, move forward, but just not to be, not to be captured by the device itself. Because I know that that can happen with me that I, the old days, before the, the, the internet, you're, you're doing a paper and anything uh, that gets your mind off of the paper, you, you, you grab at so you can take the telephone book and see if there are any Hitlers living in Manhattan, you know, something of that sort. And the internet, uh, you can attack it thinking you're doing something good and then start going off a field and get lost in it and then three hours are gone by. So it has to be a weapon used like any weapon with, with prayer and fasting uh, because it can be mis misused as, as well, but I think that I think that we have to just, I'm not in a Mauritanian sense, but we have to be hopeful, realistic, uh, but hopeful that that our sacrifice will not be in vain. Yeah, but I'm talking about being more than hopeful. I'm talking about being strategic and practical. Well, I would I would anything strategic that anybody would come up with, I would certainly be be happy to join in on and and, and you know examine. I think that that. Uh, that is being done by people. Um, how, what the next step is, uh, I don't know. The next step may be when all of these uh, totalitarian, restrictive political move, moves actually leads to clashes. And, and then when you talk about strategy, you might be talking about strategy on a much more physical level. 
But I, I don't know myself exactly what to do, except to say that anybody who has a strategy, throw it out there. <laughs> Let's try to use it. Oh, no, no, there were two people. Just. <laughs> just curious because you just came from traveling to Europe and I've been hearing that in Europe people are physically resisting. I've seen footage of people in France demonstrating against these very heavy-handed vaccine pass right. and sort of fascistic policies. How much resistance did you see in Italy? I didn't see where I was in the north at the small resort town where we have our program on Lake Garden. I didn't see any resistance. I heard a lot of anger. I heard a lot of anger. There might be 2,000 people that live in the town, and I would say that they were evenly divided among those people who were not supporters of all this, the, the, this stuff, but t terrorized, still totally terrorized by them. And now, of course, they're terrorized with this other argument, the long COVID argument that if you get even a little case, it's going to go on for 50 years, and therefore, you know, you have to stay locked up forever, that kind of thing. Um, there's, there's, there, there was that group of people there, and then there were group, groups of people who were openly and violently opposed to what's going on. And I myself know, uh, by having seen the pictures, that there are big protests in various towns in, in, in Italy as well. What I found interesting is among the immigrant population. There's Pakistanis and Tunisians who are there working in the town. Not many, but they're working there. And when I came, because I know these people for years, they, they glommed on me and said, um, what do you think about this? Um, we grew up in dictatorships. We know what a dictatorship acts like. This is a dictatorship using terror in order to control people. So they understood it perfectly. They understood it absolutely perfectly. But this whole situation of demanding that people uh, follow the line, toe the line, or be thrown out of work, just uh, uh, causes many, many people to just give in and then just simply say the next time, when it goes any step further, then I will oppose it. So I didn't see much there. I didn't see much there at all, but I heard a lot. I think we'll take one more question and then yeah, I'd more of a comment based on what Diane was saying. Diane, there are some wonderful leaders at these anti-passport marches right here in New York City. Young people who are teachers, and we know that the teachers are frustrated after, and they love to be in front of people, and I think some political careers are being born through this crisis because um, they are very dynamic, and it too, is a very deep, diverse group of people who makes very strange bedfellows who are coming together to protest this, this passport. So I think, like Dr. Ryan was saying, it's a groundswell of people, and it's just building now. It's not quite there. The wave is not yet cresting. But but it will. It's inevitable. So there there is a lot to hope for. And, and New York City, I dare say, is the only one that's standing up and holding these marches. Of course, that's because we've got the strictest rules about the, the passport. So um, that tension is what creates the resistance. Yeah, no, um, there is hope. No, I know the there other thing. Hope. I'm glad you mentioned that because I want to point out that um, uh, Maritime's whole approach, and Paul VI's whole pro approach, is just I, I think wildly, wildly optimistic um, and bound to be destructive. But that doesn't mean that there aren't people who are in non-Christian or even anti-Christian forces that can be awakened by something. Like, you, like you're saying, there are people being awakened by this. I mean, we've seen it in, in the village, in my neighborhood, people who said that they never, ever in their life would have dreamed of uh, focusing on questions involving religion and God who are now doing so because uh, this whole disaster has just pulled the blindfold away from the from their eyes um, and you know there 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 there's always the chance and especially among intelligent people um, that that there could be this uh, flip around this divine surprise so to speak that should be nurtured should really be nurtured so I, I don't want to uh, have people uh, leave here thinking that one should snarl at uh, non-Christian or anti-Christian forces that we find ourselves in. 
temporary union with, but just discern, so to speak, and teach. And try to teach, and try to teach with humor, um, and gently as well, because there are there are really, really um, um, uh, the fruits to be gained from this disaster. So thank you. That's a, a important comment. Uh, thank you all. Hope to see you again in November. Uh, there'll be more events from the Knights of Columbus on your calendars in the future. Um, please do not put the chairs away because there's an event here tomorrow. But anybody who can help with cleaning up is welcome to stick around. Oh, there's also um, an agenda for the Roman Forum available with copies, so please feel free to take one home with you tonight. There's also uh, lots of food left, so feel free to take it home for your family, including noodles and pasta made by Rennie. <laughs>